I have a little spill on arrays for you guys. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll find this a, a little bit interesting, uh, perhaps. Uh, this is on chapter 12, and it is on the concept of arrays. And we're going to look at the arrays and their properties. Creating arrays, accessing array elements using arrays inside of arrays, modifying arrays and looping and through arrays, which will help you with arrays of objects. Um, we've seen an arrays of objects, so now we're sort of working backwards to the array concept. So what does an array do? It holds several values of the same data type. So five integers, five floats, five doubles, five employees or five people or persons can all be stored together in the same object. It's based on a slot number or an index. So we have an index number zero. It always starts out with zero. That's the biggest thing with arrays. It has, causes people problems. There's instant access. It's a linear structure. So after one after the other. And it's static. Once you set the size, it's set. It cannot change, which is why people like linked list. So once you uh, figure out, whoops, wrong way. I didn't mean to do that. <coughs> Want this one here. There we go. Keep playing with my, my mouse pad. Uh, what do we got here? Once we set the structure and we set the size, it cannot be changed. So people like linked lists because then that's dynamic. So this is static. So static versus dynamic. Static doesn't change. Um, arrays hold multiple values. So here's a regular uh, variable. It's called an integer count and it's one value. And then we have array variables where we have three. So we have integer days with three. So we're going to hold three integers. And we're going to hold, hold it all under the name days. So we have day zero, days one, and days two, because there's three values total. So here we have days two, three, and four. This is the first element, the second element, and the third element. And arrays uh, days stores three types or three values for the type integer. So our arrays look like this, but things to notice here is that we have sequential ordering in memory as well. So instead of the compiler going out and picking, you know, a random number here, a random number there, and a random one over there to keep track of all these integers, it puts them actually one integer after another integer from a starting location. So the array name is generally the starting location, and then it goes out five or four, or however length you make the array. <coughs> so here's my array. It starts out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, because there's seven slots, and each one of them is indexed by an array length. So that's array length 1, array length 2, 3. And the name of the array is my array, and it's easy to be off by 1, because if you don't normally, people don't normally start counting with 0. So if you don't normally count with 0, and you're familiar with counting numbers, you're going to automatically count it like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, instead of 0, 1, 2, 3. So you have the data type followed by the name, followed by the size. So notice that you can create an array of any data type. So you can have an array of employees or an array of people or an array of integers just by changing the data type around. Here's some examples. An array of shorts. So we have short some array 50. And if we wanted to have employees, we'd put the word employee. And instead of saying employee um, Bob or Barb, we say employee barb, and then we'd have opening and closing brackets, and we put 50 in there, we have 50 barbs. Or, you know, that's multiplicity for you. Um, or any array of floats, so float my array, with float or boolean, or, you know, hopefully you get the imagine the possibilities with that. So in modifying an array, you have to specify which slot you want to put something into or change, so you use the index values. And you have to remember you're always going to be off by one. So my array three is really the fourth element. Because we have zero, one, two, three, which is the fourth element in there. Um, because we're starting with zero. And unfortunately, you can't change that. You have to leave it alone. It doesn't work. You can't decide. Enumerations, you can change the numbering and start with one. But arrays, you can't. So if I were to say my array 3 is equal to 12, I'd put 12 inside of the fourth spot. So 1, 2, 3, 4. And this doesn't work. You can't say my array is equal to 12. It's going to know, it's going to, the compiler's going to wonder well, which array index value are you talking about? Uh, and you have to say, well, number 3. Oh, okay, or number 2. So the data type on the left is equal to an array, and then the data type on the right is an integer. So you have to put only one item in, 
you have to actually specify which where to put it. Otherwise, if you did this, the memory address of my array would be equal to 12. So this is actually sort of like the reason why I like to do arrays after pointers, although arrays are easier than pointers, is because these names are representing the memory starting address, and it's just like a pointer, except for it's a named pointer. And you have 50 past this, so you have 25 past this, which means <coughs> you have sequential spaces. So you can actually go my array plus 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 plus. Or, you know, and you can, you can say my array plus one, which is going to give you the starting address plus one, the first element, plus two, the second element, plus three, third element, which is actually kind of fun, or, you know, interesting to do. Um, and then people play around with it. It confuses people to death because it's like, well, you know, <laughs> just treat it like an array if it's an array. But it's really a, a pointer. It's a starting address uh, of, a, of the structure. So accessing information, it's proper to use the indexes. So copying information out of a particular slot. I can say integer client age, and then client age is going to be equal to my array four, which is going to be the third, a fourth element of the array. So, and so this copy, excuse me, the fifth element of the array. So it copies the information from the fifth slot or slot number four into the variable client age. So, when initializing an array, you can do it in a couple of different ways. <clears throat> for most arrays, you'll use a loop to initialize them. Initializing them is to put a value in for each element. So you can create an array of five bytes and fill each slot with the number 42 if you wanted to by using this loop. So we have byte my list five. Four integer counters equal to zero, counters less than five, counter plus plus, my list counter equals equal to 42. So we're going to start with zero and go to uh, counter is less than five, so we're going to get a five. So zero, one, two, three, four for five character, five numbers. And uh, for each one of them, we're going to put the number 42 in the slot. So I don't have to go line by line, so I will skip through this part. Na, 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 na. Line by line. This is just showing you the sequential line by line execution of the 42 being added in. <coughs> All right. Finding the smallest element in an array. Um, so you actually could do a little search through array. So if you're given an array of, el of our numbers, how would you do it? If you wanted to find the smallest element, well, computers don't uh, compare two at a time. So you go through the entire list, keep track of the smallest so far, and then let's assume you have an array of five integers, and the integer contains random unknown numbers, and then the name of the array is called random array. Here to trace through what we do, we kind of look like this. So we said integer smallest so far. So we're going to keep a counter or pointer to it, not a pointer, but a counter to uh, the number. And smallest so far is equal to random array zero. And then for integer uh, counter is equal to one, counter is less than five, counter plus plus. If the smallest so far is larger than a random array counter, so each one of them in there, then Smallest so far is going to be equal to the random array counter. So it's going to be equal to random array 0, 1, 2, 3, depending upon what you get. And then if you go through here, you see we have uh, each one of them that comes through. We can figure out which one is going to be the smallest in the array by comparing it against itself and keeping that track. So you start here, and the counter is going to be equal to 0, and then number 0, so the smallest so far. We look at that and we say, well, you know, it's four, so it's always going to be the number that we're going to start with. And then we take it and we look at it and go, well, is it going to be 40? This is this is word wrapped. I'm sorry. It's 42, 17, 42. So if the smallest so far is 42, then we look at the number that's going to be in the next one, which is going to be one, which is going to be 17. And then we're going to decide, well, if the counter is equal to one, then... Uh, the smallest so far is 42. We compare, well, counters equal to 1. We take a look at 1. And we go, you know, what is number 1 <coughs> as we go through it? If 42 is larger than 17, which it is, then 17 is going to be the smallest so far. So we take the smallest so far and we replace it with 17. Now the counter is 1. So we go from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. Comparing it with what the 
value that's stored in the small. So if our next number is going to be 17, it's still smaller than 42. Is it smaller than negative 8? No. So we're going to change it to negative 8, and then we're going to come back and say, well, is the smallest so far, which is negative 8, is it smaller than 4? Yeah, so then it's going to turn out to be negative 8 in the end. So kind of skip through this. Don't need to go through this line by line either. There we go. Our last trace. Mm -hmm. This slide set is meant to go through like an illustration. So if you flip through the slides, if you put it up in PowerPoint, flip through it, it kind of does like a little flip, 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 flip. So that's why this is not PowerPoint. That's why I kind of jump through it like that. Passing arrays to functions. So arrays get passed to functions passed by reference instead of passed by value, which is actually kind of interesting. Uh, you can actually change the value of an array inside of a function. Why do we do that? Because as I mentioned before, the name of the array is a memory address. It gets, it's actually a pointer, but it's implemented in a special structure. They call it a, an array. So passing arrays to functions, you can do it in multiple different ways. <coughs> Here's void modify array. Modify array is actually taking the array. So stuff that happens inside of the function is going to change. This is kind of like the change function that changes a pointer. So stuff that happens inside of the function is going to change the permanent contents of the array. So normally when we uh, accept an array, we also have to accept the size of the array. So we have to say, because we don't know how big the array is going to be. Not like a string where we have a size method that comes around and says, you know, how big is this array? We can actually write one if we want to. Uh, but in this particular case, we don't have one by default. Uh, so <clears throat> we send the array size along with the size of the, uh, along with the array itself. And then from main, here we have our modify array, and we send the name of the array. Very similar to sending PTR, actually. And then up here we'd have an asterisk, integer asterisk PTR. But we don't. Instead of the asterisk, we have this symbol here, the opening and closing bracket. It's actually the same thing. So when we send an array as a parameter to a function, we're sending it passed by reference. So inside the function, everything's going to change the value of the array. That's a nice side. Of, that's a nice feature when you want it. It's a bad side effect when you don't want it. Uh, so here we're sending 15 because there's 15 items, and we're sending the name of the array, which is my array. So it gets sent to the function, and then inside we can go through 15 times. So we know how many times to loop through the function inside the array. So the overall concept is the arrays hold values that are all of the same data type. And they're static in size, which means they don't change. <clears throat> and we can always create arrays um, using a couple of different formats. We can create an array as an, any type, initialize it to search through arrays, and also almost any loop can work with an array. So here's some initial, more initialization um, techniques for you. So you can initialize all three index values of an array A. The array name is called A. So integer A3. And we said uh, 2, comma, 12, comma, 1. So we initialized it when we created it. So this is a declaration and an initialization all in one. Which is equivalent to integer A3, A0, A1, A2 is equal to these three numbers. Or we can set the, auto the size automatically here. So we can say integer b is equal to, and then we have 5, 12, 11, which is equivalent to saying integer b3 is equal to 5, 12, and 11. Well, it's the same kind of initialization. But here we put the number 3. If we leave the number out, it will be counted automatically for us. So we know, oh, look at that. There's three of them. So the number will be set to 3. So the leaving putting the number in is sort of optional. If fewer values are listed than the index variables, the remaining index values are initialized to zero. So if there are integers or spaces, if they're characters or strings, actually string won't be initialized. It's to the length of the string itself. So here we have um, integer C5, and we put uh, one, two, three numbers in there, so the four and the fifth number are zero. So uninitialized elements are set to zero, and only initializes the first three elements of a five-element array. So in terms of initializing strings, this is where things are a little bit different. 
If a string constant is used, the null terminator is automatically included at the end. So here's an element data type character. And this is what I mean by string. This is a string. These are characters. So if you automatically put the string, the two brackets here, and make it a string, you automatically get the null character at the end. So the size is automatically to the length of the string plus one, and the one is for the null character. This is what the null character actually looks like. It's a forward slash and an O. It looks different on different operating systems, however, so don't be fooled. It might actually uh, come up differently if you try to print out a null character to a screen. It might look differently. But uh, in concept, it's a char single character that represents null, which is the end of the, end of the structure. And uh, this is character data type, which is equivalent to string. And then we have the name of the data, uh, name of the array with the opening and closing array brackets. This is equivalent to saying character with a pointer, and then the name of the character uh, array. So using a pointer symbol for reference and using these opening and closing brackets in this particular context is almost identical. So sometimes you'll see it with a character pointer in the name, which is actually equivalent to a string. So which is actually kind of interesting, because this is the starting address, and it's going to hold up to the length of the string plus one for the null character. So you can initialize it both ways. <clears throat> so for those people who don't like the concept of pointers, won't ever use a pointer, then you'll do a character array. If you don't like, you know, uh, if you know it's a pointer, then you'll make it as a pointer. Why, why bother with this opening and closing array stuff? So, so it's equivalent to this here. If we say that uh, character short four is A, B, C, well, plus we have the null character at the end. It's not equivalent to this here. So if we do character short, we don't use the opening and closing brackets, but instead we use the characters themselves. No null character. Not equivalent to a string. Not equivalent, well, it is equivalent to a string, but, and it is equivalent to a pointer. But we don't get the null character because we're not saying it's a string. So. Oh yeah, you can still do it this way. You can still work with this the same way. You just don't get the null character. The only different, yeah, the only thing different between the character array and a string character array, if you treat it like a string, is that null character. And that's actually only in later versions of C++. <laughs> Original version never put the null character on it. Is it what? Is it valid? What valid? valid? Of course. A string is a string, right? Depends on how you want to use it. If you don't know that there's no null character because you loaded it up like a character array instead of a string array, then you might be looking for a null and never find it. So then you have to know how many characters are in there and you use the counts. Depends on how you want to use the array in terms of whether it's going to cause you a problem or not. In this particular case down below, we're checking. So the loop ends with the element for the null character. Well, you can't check for a null character if there's no null character in there. You could put one in yourself, though, if you wanted to. But your array's too short. You'd have to make the array bigger, populate the characters in there, and then add the null character at the end. Which is kind of bothersome, actually. If you wanted it in, just make it a string, and it puts it in automatically for you. So here's a, a character array also as indexed variables. <coughs> so we have um, the short string 0, 1, 2, and 3. They can also be accessed instead of accessing them all together. You can take each one of the characters separately. But you can take A, B, C, and you can actually get each one of the characters separately as well. You can say, you know, it doesn't really matter that you put it in as a string, you can still use it as a character array. And just because you put it in as a character array, you can still use it as a string. It's just whether or not this null characters at the end is going to be your biggest difference. So here's a loop that loops until the null character is found. So while short index doesn't equal null, <coughs> and you can search for null, then the index is going to be equal to x. It's going to change all the characters to x, and then index plus plus. And then it's going to go to next one, next one, next one. So processing arrays is the same as processing other variables. So if I said integer scores 5, and that one's equal to 5 scores, they're all integers that I gave it, I can go plus plus score 2, or I can go score 2 plus plus if I wanted to, to increment the value that's in number 2. If the integer result is equal to score 4 times 2, basically I take this index value 
along with the name of the array, and I resolve it down to a number. It's going to resolve down to an integer, and then the integer can be used in multiplication, and subtraction, anything you want. So it initializes the result to a value, score 4, and then times it by 2. So if score 3 is less than score 4, we'll do a comparison between the values that are stored in 3 and 4 and see if that's true or false. And then while score count doesn't equal 0, well, it's looking at whatever values in count. So it iterates as long as there's a score count. It doesn't appear to be 0. We also have the concept of parallel arrays. So using two or more arrays to represent relationships among different data types. So we have a constant integer number of employees is the number of employees. And then we have, let's say for example, uh, store hours. So remember in arrays that you can only store one data, and or it could be a structure, or it could be a, a class or something, but it's one type of data. So it's one structure, one object of type, or one primitive type. You can't mix and match types. So if you wanted to, you could create multiple arrays, which is why they call them parallel arrays. And then for each one of the parallel arrays, for all of the index zero values, it all correlates to employee zero. And then employee one, employee two, employee three. So you have first name, last name, date of birth, um, start date, um, pay rate, all the information floats double strings. In each one of the individual arrays, you line them all up by their index values, and all those zeros represent one employee, all the ones represent another employee. Not a multiple dimensional array, they call it parallel arrays. And multiple, multiple dimensional arrays will store rows and columns of information that are related together, um, but not um, in separate structures, but all in the same structure. So in this parallel array example, we have um, integer for a number of employees that we're going to use as a constant value that we're going to stick inside of these and we have one that's integers and one that's floats. So elements of integers and elements of floats and these are the these are the two parallel arrays right here actually. The hours and the pay rate. And then we can put them in simultaneously so for index is equal to zero, index is less than number of employees, index plus plus we can see out that the hours for each one of the employees and then go index plus one to increment it and then go hours index and then go pay rate index so the index values are what's keeping the parallel arrays consistent among all of the different arrays making it so you can find if you're employee number one then you're number one in all these other arrays too so. Printing array contents, you can use a loop to display the contents in each one of your elements. So here we have integer test array 5, and it has a bunch of um, 5 elements in it. This doesn't work to say see out test array. What are you going to get? The memory address, the hexadecimal memory address of where test array is stored in memory. Not going to be very helpful. Displays the address. This one does work, however. It's a loop, and the loop that gets put together says that the uh, Counts equal to zero, counts less than five, count plus plus. See out test array counts. So it's going to print out each one of the elements that's in that array. And an exception is displaying the contents of a character array containing a C string. And, and if it contains a C string, you're going to actually print out the starting address. As remember before, the uh, strings are a bit different. So character arrays that are holding characters or strings the character name can actually be printed out. So we go see out name and we get and so we don't have to go name 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. We don't have to create a loop to print out a string. It's one of the exceptions actually. And C++ has a lot of these little exceptions where you know this works but that doesn't work you know kind of thing. So displays a string not an array address which is kind of weird. You'd think it would display an array address. And it displays it up until the null character and then it knows how to stop it. So I'm given a character array to determine the end of the string by the null character. So. But you don't have to have that null character. We'll actually print out a regular character array without the null character, so, which is kind of weird. So. Array elements as function arguments. Let's go back to this concept here. So with each loop iteration, the value contained in test array CT is passed to the function show value. So we're going to use a function to show the values 
that are being printed out from these arrays. So the function prototypes on top and it's called show value and it's implemented underneath here and it's taking an integer value and those integer values are just coming from the arrays. It's an integer array and it's coming from each one of the values. So in here we have integer test array that has five values in it and then four, the count is equal to zero, counts less than five, count plus plus, run them call to show value and what we're going to run is this test array C so it's an array element that's of type integer is the argument so this is passed by value it's not a reference because what you're looking at is a number that's being sent not an array so this will not change anything in the array um, so but what we'll do is we'll just show it out why do you want to do this you don't have to do it this way in fact, it might be better just to loop it out right here. You got the loop going on right here. You might as well just put the C out right here, but then you wouldn't be able to see what a function would look like. So you can send it as an argument. So array elements can be passed by value or by reference. That's the by value. As mentioned before, and what we saw before is the reference. So any changes to the parameter nums affects the arguments in test array. So we replace this in here from an integer and we created it into an array so we say integer arrays or integer nums excuse me so we do the same thing but we send the whole array instead of each one of the individual values and now we send test array so it's kind of like a pointer we're sending the name of the array just the name which is the starting address of the array which is the reference to it sending it as a parameter to the function show values. Now things can change inside of it. So the starting address of the array is passed to the function inside of the function. We can change the values of it. It's changed permanently for the array because it goes out into memory and actually changes the values that are associated there. Kind of dangerous. They call it a side effect because uh, it's a function side effect because do you really want it to change? Well, I need to just put the keyword constant on here, and it's not going to change. <laughs> so there's ways of fixing that problem. But sometimes you want it to change. So you can send arrays by value or by reference. If you send the array itself, it's always by reference by default. If you send values inside of the arrays by value, so it's the easier way to remember it. So here's some examples, more examples of arrays as function arguments. Usually you use two arguments with it, as mentioned before, the address of the array along, along with the size of the array. So you know, modify the function show value to display the contents of an integer array and any size. So here we have a uh, test array 1, 2, and 3, and we're going to send the show value test array 1, 2, and 3, and we have size. So depending upon which array we send it, we're going to send a different size because they have different sizes in them. And then when we send it, it's all going to be treated the same. So we have uh, the array that's going to come in, and we're going to reference it inside of the function using this name nums. And the size is going to be, you know, CT is going to be smaller than size. Well, size is going to be 5, 2, or 7, depending upon which array we're sending. And we're going to loop through and print out the numbers or do something with it. So. So array parameters that uh, give direct access to array arguments. So here we have a double array, uh, which is the function up here. This is a function prototype for a function called double array. And it takes in uh, an array along with a size. And then down here on the bottom, we have double array. So for i is equal to 0, i is less than size, i plus plus, numbers i times equals 2, which means double it, make it equal to 2. So this is the name of the array, and uh, we're going to take that and we're going to put the size in there. And for the size, we're going to go through. So this just changes the values of the array numbers and also the one for test array. So although we sent this, we sent the memory address test array. So inside, although we referenced it by the word nums instead of test array, inside there we actually updated both of them because they're pointers. This is, this is a pointer variable, actually, so it's, it's going to be updated, and that's the side effect I was talking about. Once the function's over with, it changes it permanently. 
So we're stuck with um, a double array, whether or not we want to use it continuously or not. So, so we also have two-dimensional arrays and a two-dimensional array. The first one is the row. The second one is the columns. So just remember rows and columns. Rows go across, columns go up and down. Easy to remember, regular arrays just have rows in them, rows of things. So we want to add the columns, then it's a double-dimensional array, and that's the second one. So here's what it looks like in several different identical arrays that are put together. Uh, so we have row 0, row 1, row 2, which is 0, 1, 2 in the first element, if we have 3. And then we have 0, 1, 2 columns, so that's a 3, 3. So number of rows with number of columns. So we have one, two, three rows, three columns. And so the score one, two is going to be equal to 93.2 you know, as an example. Well, although we have two numbers, we only have one number that goes, these are each one of the cells. So these are individual cells. So we only have one value that gets stored in each one of these. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. Etc. And to print it out, we can do the same thing. So instead of there just being one value, we have two values that come out of that. Or two values that we put in for rows and columns, we get one value that comes out. So we could put a nested loop in here, and then it's used to process each element of a two dimensional array. So we have a, here, we have a 4 standard is equal to 0, S standard is uh, less than 3, STD++, plus plus, our outer loop inside. This is, a, what is this for standard deviation or something, or I don't know, scores. Um, inside we have another loop that says 4 exams equal to 0, exams less than 3, exam++. Plus plus. Then print out student with this number from the outer loop along with this number from the inner loop. So we're combining both of the informations for each one of the layers. So with a, a double um, two-dimensional array, we have a loop inside of a loop, normally. So we have two loops that go on. And then if we print it out, we're going to have a student one, student two, student one who has exam one, student one who has exam two, etc. So we can keep track of different students with different exams. You can also use a two-dimensional array as a function argument. So instead of sending just the function, excuse me, just one of the elements, you can send both. So the number of columns is specified in the two-dimensional array parameter, and you leave the rows empty. So you'll only put two columns, three columns, how many columns you have here. And then you put in the number of rows. How many rows do you have as a separate item? So here's show array and you're leaving the first part empty and you're putting the columns here which is two and then the number of rows that you want to want to take to it. And you can actually optionally not take any rows. You just take the second columns in if you wanted to. Because you can figure out the columns. You can figure out the rows from the columns actually depending upon how many columns you've got. So here we have a, a, an integer table that has three two that is equal to eight five and seven nine and six three that we're going to populate in. So you use extra brackets that enclose each row's values that are optional. You can stick in there. And then here we can go to table 3. So this, this um, function here that's prototyped up here gets called here with the name of the, of the array, which is called table. And then we're going to stick in here the number of rows that we're going to put in here, row 1, row 2, row 3. That we're going to stick in there, which is row 1, row 2, row 3. And then uh, if we were to implement this particular um, array uh, function, we would uh, have an outer loop and an inner loop. So just think multiple dimensional arrays, two dimensions, usually have an outer and an inner loop. One to go through all the rows and the other one to go through all the columns. Or go through all the columns and then go through all the rows, depending upon what you're trying to do to it. So the first one is going to be the rows. So uh, while well, R is less than the rows, R plus plus. And then for each one of the rows, we have another one for the columns. Columns equal to zero, columns less than two, column plus plus, and then print out there uh, iterates the columns and the rows. So. so arrays of strings can be used as character arrays. So a two-dimensional array of characters that can be used as multiple arrays of strings. 
So what do we get here? We have a character team for nine, which means we have four names, and each name could be nine characters long. So we have Ned, Connie, Pat, and Greg that are part of this uh, team. So it kind of looks like this in memory, the four names that are eight characters long, plus a null character at the end for the ninth. So we have nine characters. And the maximum length is nine minus one for the null terminator that's at the end. So the name of the array with only a row index is the address of that row. So see out team two is Pat. So program is two. So when we pick out the two, we get the address, starting address, which is the same as printing out the name of the string. So you remember before I said you could just print out the name of the string or character array, and then you get the whole entire thing because you get the starting address and it prints out the entire string. So now all I have to do is say two. That's two. You get uh, pat, zero, one, two, and you get the entire row that gets printed out. And the entire row in this case is called pat. So it's another shortcut method that you can use. You don't have to actually print out how long pat is. We don't care. We have the null character at the end. It says pat's going to... Actually, she's only one, two, three, four characters long because of the null character at the end. So the loop displays all the names in the array. So we can go here, and here's a loop that would display all the names by just getting the row. So row 1, 2, 3, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, all the four rows would print out the four names that's in the array. So, so that was uh, an introduction to the array concept, or lecture number four. Uh, so let me remove this off my desktop so I don't deal with it here. In number five that follows it, let's take a look here. Unless preview is going to uh, preview, unless preview is going to die on me, I have some additional information on the concept of multiple dimensional arrays, and uh, take a look at these uh, in a little bit more detail. We can go past two dimensions. Most people don't actually go past two, but I'll show you the multiple dimensions of it. And also looking at the keyword constant. So the keyword constant can create in a situation where we don't have that. That unnecessary side effect, as I mentioned before. So declaring and using one-dimensional, we already saw that, so I'm just going to skip through a few things. Passing an array as a function argument, well, we saw that, so we'll review that, you know, just see it, more examples, essentially. Uh, using constant, using an array structure or class object in an array. Using a num for index types of an array, and declaring and using two-dimensional arrays, two-dimensional and four-dimensional, multiple-dimensional. So if you have the book for this course, this is where it's coming from. It's actually chapter 12, I believe. Let me refresh my memory. It is chapter 12. Yeah. We are familiar with the structure type already. And we know that we have, a, let's say, for example, a structure that we can create that has uh, multiple different pieces of data inside of it. Well, you can create an array of structures if you want. So here's an array of total of three blood pressures, all kept separately in the form of integers. If you want to store them together, you have to keep them all separated out. So in a one-dimensional array, we just actually came through a few minutes ago. We would do something like this. If we weren't going to use a structure, we were just going to use integers or floats or a single variable, single data type. We have float temps 5 that keeps track of five elements. And we have memory addresses that are in sequentially for the numbering system from the base plus the length of an integer. So here we have 704, 708, 712, etc. So it's incremented um, in terms of its value. So we have a base address, which is the beginning address. Then we have the subscripts added together. And here's another example of the characters. Now we see it's off by one character because it's not storing an integer, it's storing a character. So we have 6,000, 6,001, 6,002 etc. For each one of the 10 items that's going to be part of this name. So you could go here and say, I yeah, you know, to say temps 2, temps 3, we know how to assign values to array indexes. There's a little bit of an overlap, so I'm kind of skipping through the stuff we've already covered. Um, if this is um, brand new to you, uh, then you probably want to go a little bit slower. This one is lecture number 5. The one I just did a few minutes ago was lecture number 4. So. We can alloc allocate the memory for the, each one of the arrays here, populate it using a loop, that's what we saw before. 
and then we can print them out as well. For the variable subscripts, we can do a bunch of things inside. And so instead of just saying, you know, element temps 1 or 0 or 3 or 4, we can use a value like m and say m is equal to 3 and go 3 plus 1, which would equal 4. Or we could go this temp, which is at element number 3 plus 1, which would give us 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 100.6 plus 1, so 101.6 is what we'd get out of that. Because we'd add it after we resolved this value here. We would add 1 to whatever value came out of that array. So you have to know what you're doing in terms of, do I want the value at that index, or do I want the value at the next index, or is it that, that value plus something that I'm trying to get out of it? So. Getting a little closer at the compiler, we have here we have this declaration that allocates five floats. So the value of the identifier is temps, along with the base address of the array. So we say temps is a pointer because its value is an address. It points to a memory address. So we can actually go temps plus plus and get to the incrementing addresses of the other array indexes without using the indexes if we wanted to, as I was mentioning before. So in terms of the initialization, we can actually figure out how much memory to reserve for temps or for ages or something by its assigning. So here's initializing in terms of its declaration. Um, and we can, you know, know that it's stored sequentially, is what I'm trying to say. Because sometimes you'll see it done differently and you'll go, what in the world? why are they doing that? Because they can. It's not in standard. So. So we know we can pass it, they're always passed by reference. Arrays are always passed by reference. Uh, there's no aggregate operations that can be done on an array. <coughs> so the only thing you can do with an entire array as an aggregate is you use it as a component and pass it to a function, or use it as an argument. You can't say one array is equal to another array. It doesn't work. Uh, the exception here is permitted for C strings. So C strings, you can actually say one string is equal to another string which is kind of ironic when you think about it. So it's an, another break in the consistency. So using arrays as arguments to functions, as we've seen so far, there's generally two arguments. There's the array plus the size of the array. The array name is the beginning address plus the number of elements that we're sending. So here's an example here. Find the warmest and find the average, and then print. Do we want, really want to change any of the components in here? No. So we use the keyword constant, which is in blue on this slide here. We put constant in here in the parameter list. We can actually put it outside or we could put it inside. In this particular case, we put it inside to say that we can't change it. The array is not changeable, which means treat it like a value instead of by reference. By default, it's a reference. So in terms of its implementation, if we find it temps, number of days and average is sent here, which are numbers that are going to come in through an array, an integer, and an integer address that we can put in here. So allocating memory, so temps, temp 31 is going to hold 31 temperatures, so we have the base address here might be 6,000, and then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 that's added to it. We can do a obtain, so the user can get a list of addresses, as an example, or populate an array through, um, and this time we want to change it because we want to go get, we want to go get those addresses. So we create a function where we, you know, send the array to the function, the function gets all these stuff from the user. So it has the user enter into the temperature values from the keyboard, puts it in. When the function's over, we don't have to pass anything back. It automatically gets populated for us. And in this case here, this is an example of just printing everything out. So we're going to avoid print and then print out, taking in constant. And here we have to see the syntax of constant. So it's integer temp. If we left out that word that I highlighted there, and this is just notate, these are comments to so say this is what's coming into the array. We're taking in a constant value that we're not going to change. It's going to be integer temp. And there's a comma, and then it says integer number. So it's the size, and then it's also the array itself that's being passed as an argument to this function. 
And then this little method here, actually it's not a method, it's a function to set the width to 7, creates a column order for us. So instead of using a space or a tab, it's a way of lining up a bunch of temperatures that are going to be 7, indented by 7 spaces. So we can have them uh, column, column ordered. So the use of constant here. So because the identifier of the array holds the base address of the array, and the ampersand is never needed for an array in a parameter list, which is interesting. You'll never see, you'll see the opening and closing brackets for the array, for the symbol to say, hey, we're looking for an array. But when you send it, you never send the address of. You always send the name of the array, which is kind of odd. That's why arrays are always passed by reference. So it's inconsistent with other things in the language. But to prevent the array from being used by reference and unintentionally changed, you just place that keyword constant. C-O-N-S is what constant says, is what that stands for. In the function header and also in the prototype we saw before. So here it is in the prototype. We saw it in a few examples. <coughs> Do not use constant with outgoing arrays because the function is supposed to change the array values. So if we want to get something and put it into the array, we're not going to use constant. But if we want to print out the array or find something in the array, we'll use constant. Otherwise, we end, might end up reordering the array. We're doing something to the array inside of the function that we might not necessarily desire. So it prevents things from happening unintentionally. This slide set, again, has a bunch of uh, examples in it. So. Using arrays for counters, that's a very typical usage of arrays. So you can write a program to count the number of each alphabetical letter in a text file by using the ASCII code that's associated with the text, with the, with the character file. So you can have a file reads it in. A is like uh, number 65. So you have a pretty big array that's going up to 90 characters. 0 through, 64, through 64 is being kept empty. You're just using the later part of the array. Is it efficient? Not so. Is it useful? Yeah, very useful. So you have the uh, size is 91 and then you have the frequency count for the size. Well, everything up to 65 is empty. And then we start adding a counter in for every one of the characters. So it counts A and then A and counts B and then B for each one of the different indexes and then we can keep a counter. So, why do we want to do that? Because eh, we want to keep track of all the characters. I don't know. It's just a useful application of it. So, I'm not going to go through the source code for it, but in this particular case, print occurrences is using constant here because we just want to print it out. We don't want to list anything out. So more about array indexes, they don't have to be numbers. You can actually use enumerations or characters in there. So array index can be an integral value. It includes character and enumeration type. So if the program is responsible for making sure that the array indexes doesn't go out of bounds, you can actually declare the size of an array as 5 and then write into the 6th element or the 7th or something. And what you're doing is you're writing out of bounds. But there's no checking. There's no error checking on arrays. So bounds are never, they, uh, array bounds are never checked, which is kind of risky, again, so going back to C++, not to cut the language down completely, but uh, same, happens, same thing happens in other languages as well. Uh, there's no error checking on arrays, or pointers either, for that matter. So it has to be within zero and the size of the array that you've created. So using an, an index value outside the range causes... Uh, Memory that's not assigned to the array to be accessed, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It causes one of those inconsistencies that sometimes gets, uh, get, that occurs. So remember the enumerations? We can use an enumeration as an index type because the enumeration is a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're putting a number in or a character in, depending upon how we want to keep track of things. So we can use a character as an example. We have this enumeration department, and the departments are women's, men's, children's, linens, housewares, and electronics. Well, isn't that equivalent to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5? <laughs> if it equates down to a number, which is why people go, you know, um, instead of using an enumeration, they might use a constant uh, array size or size. And you put size in there, and size is equal to 5 or something. 
If it reduces down to an integer value, it can be used, no problem. So we have sales amount 6 in department which, and then for which is equal to women's, and which is less than or equal to electronics, which is equal to department, which plus 1. I'm like, well, does that make it any more user friendly? Uh, most people will go back and go, what? And then sales amount which? Uh, well, which is the department? What's the department? Well, the department is department. Department is enumeration. Enumeration is women's, men's, or what? It's zero through five, but there's six of them. It makes it a little easier if you don't like numbers. You can use enumerations. There's some people that like enumerations, and there are some people that don't. I don't particularly like enumerations. It makes things look weird. Textbooks, for some strange use, and C++ textbooks love enumerations. In fact, you can do a type defines and enumerations together and then just change the language completely. Because a type define is like a rename. It takes, take int, type define it as int e g e r, and then you're typing integer i instead of int i, or, you know, creating a fake boolean from a integer true or false, zero, one. You're making up your own data types by renaming other data types, and I'm thinking, well, why not just use the original data type? Because some people think better with the different names or something. I'm not sure. Anyway, so I, it's some people like them, some people. Like. I never use type defines. I never use enumerations. It doesn't help with the readability of the code. Uh, so here's float sales amount. And if you haven't noticed, enumerations. Well, originally enumerations and type defines were not part of Java. So not part of other other languages as well. Although they are part of Objective C, which is kind of funny. So sales amount women, sales amount men's, children. So it's a little bit more meaningful versus zero, one, two. Yeah. How do we know what sales amount three is? Well, it's linens. <laughs> so we can put linens in here, remember? Oh, that's the linens, and here's the men's and the children's. Ah, okay. Then we know which department by zero, one, two, three. You can put employee names in here, I guess, too. You know, enumerations of employee names and stuff. So. We saw the parallel arrays. There's a number uh, being used. So the other thing to kind of keep in mind with parallel arrays, if you use a constant integer size and set it to something, you can use size and everything here. So size is going to be whatever integer value that's associated with it. And you have one that, so you don't have the mistake of creating parallel arrays in which you have ID numbers that are 49 and hourly wage that's 62 length. You want them to match completely. So you use a constant value like size to initialize all your arrays. And then you know how big each one should be. It doesn't really matter. It's just whatever size is set to. And then you set size at the beginning of the program and then you have the same size arrays that run in parallel. So you don't have any odd non-matching entries in one array versus another. Or you don't accidentally write past one array um, because you're trying to match it with another array and you're trying to make sure that the sizes match. So, yeah. All right, so here's the zeros and the zeros adding up together with the floats and integers in this particular example. Yeah. Arrays of structures. So now we have a structure in here. A structure is going to be animal type. An animal type, Bronx Zoo with maximum size. Same thing was worked for classes. Remember, as I said earlier, a structure and a class are pretty much the same thing. Same thing worked for objects and structures. So we can say structure animal type, and then animal type, which is the data type. We're going to call this array Bronx Zoo, and Bronx Zoo, and then inside, we're going to say that's the maximum size. Maximum size is 500. And inside the structure, we're going to use this enumeration here for health type. <laughs> so we're going to really complicate things for us. I actually showed you arrays of objects in the first weekend as well. So. But we didn't look at them for more than a brief second. Um, so we use the index value. We say the dot. We can run methods. This is just running uh, the data. We can set if this was a class and it had methods in it. You can actually put functions inside of structures. They don't call them methods, they call them functions. But they can put that inside of a structure. You can essentially take a full-on, non-inherited class and replace the word class with structure, and it works the same way. It's just kind of ironic, actually. 
They should have just gone away with structures, made everything a class. But people like structures. Why? It's the same thing. <laughs> it's a lightweight class. Think of it that way. It does the same thing, acts the same way, has the same functionality except for object orientation. It's the non-object oriented version of the class. So it takes up the same amount of memory. It can be dynamically loaded. It can be a pointer. It can be an array. It can be used in any context. So using the dot notation and the index value. So here we have zero and we have the dot ID, dot name, species, age, all the different data members. And consequently, we can also, you know, run the methods that are associated as well with each instance. So you can add one to the age of a member of each one of the elements of the Bronx Zero Array by going, uh, if you're going J is equal to J, zero, J is less than the maximum size, J plus plus, Bronx Zoo, J dot age is going to be equal to the age plus one. So you've incremented everybody's age. I just keep a birth date in there and calculate the age. <laughs> but if you didn't, you want to increment the age every year, you can do it this way. So you can find the total weights of all the elements in the Bronx Zoo Array by adding them all up using a loop like this. So time type, another, this is a class, and in our class here, we have public and private data members. Uh, you don't actually have that in a structure. That's, that's one of the differences. You don't have access methods because you don't have object orientation features. So there's no such thing as a public or a private anything in a structure. In fact, the keywords will cause problems for you. So. The time type class instance looks like this when you put it into a memory. It has hours, minutes, and seconds. I'm not going to go through the whole example, but uh, in here you've got um, the data members on the bottom, member functions on the top. And you have hours, minutes, and seconds representing time. And you got a couple of constructors and, and equals. You can see if one time is less than another time, you can increment the time, stuff like that. Don't worry about the time. We're going to get out soon. <laughs> the time type class should be the ITU time type class. Arrays of class objects. Same thing as before. I just needed to show you what the objects, uh, arrays of objects look like. Time type. You just use the data type. This would be employee my employees 50 or time type train schedule maximum size which is 50 so the default constructor if there is any constructor fires automatically for each one of the elements in here we can also specify which constructor to run and I'll save that example actually for tomorrow morning but, uh, so two-dimensional arrays is a collection of components, all of the same type, structured in two dimensions, as we've seen before. Rows and columns. So we're familiar with rows and columns that are of a two dimension. Let's take it a step further. Look at three-dimensional arrays. Uh, let's see. I don't have to go, we just saw this two-dimensional array a few minutes ago. And again, this is like a second week. Uh, viewed another way we have um, the, the order in which the memory is stored and it's all stored in a big line. The memory is actually stored sequentially. The rows come first and then the columns come second which is actually kind of interesting in terms of its memory representation. So, which is why we can get all the rows and then or get all the columns and worry about the rows second. So arrays as parameters just as uh, one-dimensional arrays we send the size we saw before. Send the number of rows or the number of columns. In this particular case, we're going to send the number of columns. So we've seen this uh, type defined with arrays. We can do that as well. We just looked at. Here we go. This is what I wanted to show you. So now we have declaring three-dimensional arrays. So we have rows and columns, and now we have sheets. So in this particular case, we have the number of departments, 5, number of months, 12, number of stores, 3. There's where we get our three dimensions. Versus, let's say, for example, um, number of departments and number of stores, or which would be two dimensions, or months with stores, or months with departments. So if you don't want to do two-dimensional arrays and run them in parallel, you do a three-dimensional array. So you really have to think about the rows, the columns, and then the third element, which are the sheets. Of sheets. Well, in here, this has got the number of stores as a sheet. So the rows are a number of departments, uh, department number. So this department is going to be uh, 
women's uh, children clothing electronics and then the number of months so it's going to be 12 months so we're going to have January, February, March, April, May, June and then the store so this is going to be uh, White Marsh uh, you just figure the city where the store is located or it could be store number one, store number two, store number three so think about it you have three dimensions that you're keeping track of and it kind of looks like this three store sheets with five departments in each store and 12 months for each year. So monthly sales for 370 is a uh, rose. So it's department three, month seven, July, and sheet zero, store number one. And we get to change it and go store number two, store number three, store number all the way up to three stores. So we have zero, one, and two that we can put in for sheets. So we can figure out, well, this is the sales for electronics in August in White Marsh. Well, we got the month off because I forgot about the zero. That's really eight, <laughs> August. So that's our third dimension, three-dimensional list. And we can print it out. Well, we can add a fourth dimension, too. Actually, we can add a fifth and a sixth if we want. If we want a four-dimensional array, we got departments, months, stores. What about years? Year one, year two, year three. So now we have, um, what do you call the fourth dimension? It's not sheets. I don't remember what you call it, actually. So it goes rows, columns, sheets, and then the fourth is something else I can't remember right now. I'm having a mind blank. But uh, here we have year one, year two, year three. It's category? I can't remember. I can't remember what it's called. There's a word for it. Rows, columns, sheets, and something. <laughs> And that's about as high as I go. I don't really create anything past four dimensions. I'm never. Why would you want to do that? I guess you can go years. Well, you could go number of years, year one, year two, year three. Um, by manager, I'm going to add another one in there. By the fifth element could be um, regional managers, maybe. If you have more than one regional manager for year one, year two, year three. Each one of the regional managers can keep track of each one of their yearly sales for each one of their stores, for each one of the months, and each one of the departments. <laughs> so you could take it out a couple more levels, I think. But um, you can see how it might get a little confusing in the end, actually. So that's what I wanted to show you for the rest of today, which means we're pretty much done for the lecture part of today, which is why I'm going to kind of shut this off here.